So I've got a lot of respect for what you guys have done. Demonstrating that innovation doesn't come from private for-profit sector players. Welcome to ICANN, a podcast about ophthalmology through a uniquely Canadian lens with Dr. Sarah Ziai and myself, Dr. Guillermo Rocha. This season, we have two new co-hosts joining us, Dr. Mona Dagger and Dr. Hadi Saheb. They'll be hosting upcoming episodes throughout the season. Season three of the ICANN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the ICANN podcast. On this episode of ICANN, we're excited to introduce our listeners to Dr. Robert Bell, also known as Dr. Bob, and he's got an amazing website that you should check out. So Dr. Bell, after completing medical school and internship at McGill University in 1976, he started his medical career first as a general practitioner and emergency physician in Peterborough and Brampton, Ontario. He then went on to complete an orthopedic surgery uh, residency training at University of Toronto, and he achieved his FRCSC in 1983. He then undertook a fellowship in orthopedic oncology and complex joint uh, reconstruction at Harvard University and the Massachusetts General Hospital. During his clinical career, Dr. Bell was appointed professor of surgery at the University of Toronto and published more than 200 peer-reviewed articles and achieved more than $5 million in peer-reviewed scientific grants. At the end of his clinical career, he served nine years as CEO of Canada's largest research hospital, the University Health Network, and four years as Ontario's Deputy Minister of Health. Dr. Bell is an internationally recognized orthopedic surgeon, clinician scientist, and educator, and has chaired expert panels that provided advice on emergency room overcrowding, critical care capacity, vision care, eye surgery, and neurosurgical care in Ontario. I can't think of a more important and more timely guest than you, Dr. Bell, to our ICANN podcast, given all the headlines that we're seeing about healthcare in Canada at the point. So uh, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much, Guillermo. And if you wouldn't mind calling me Bob, I'd appreciate it. Excellent. Yes. So, Bob, um, to start off with, we would like to focus on your Globe and Mail series called Fixing Canadian Healthcare, 10 Ways to Make Treatment Faster, better and more cost effective. It's almost like the holy grail of what we need to know in healthcare and specifically on three topics. But before I get to those topics, I would like to ask you, Bob, what prompted the creation of the series and how did these 10 topics emerge? Yeah, thanks, Guillermo. Well, you know, these articles, this series was co-written with uh, three friends and colleagues, Anne Golden, who's former CEO of Conference Board of Canada, And importantly, a tremendous social thinker who also served as a CEO of the United Way in Toronto, transformed that organization. And two people I worked with closely at the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation uh, through my career as an orthopedic oncology surgeon Mm -hmm. and administrator at UHN, Lionel Robbins, who was the chair of the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation, Paul Aloffs, who was the CEO. And the four of us gathered together toward, you know, toward the transit. I'm not going to say the end of the pandemic because that's ridiculous. Mm. It's still going on. Yeah. Point where we started to gather again, uh, we gathered and we recognized an increasing sense of crisis. This was back last year in May or earlier Mm -hmm. this year, pardon me, in May. So May 22. And we recognized a, a, a sense of crisis that we were perceiving from clinical colleagues and importantly, my colleagues, those the other three people had lots of friends who were experiencing difficulties with the healthcare system. And it sort of started us thinking that, you know, we, I think we all recognize the Canadian healthcare system has been under strain for many years. Mm-hmm. The pandemic has increased that strain, especially in the area of health human resources. And as people began to recognize the fact that service was not as good as it needed to be, that people were waiting too long, that people couldn't get access to care the way they needed to get access, 
as people recognize the quote unquote crisis, mm -hmm. the immediate solution that started to bubble up everywhere in newspapers and editorials, we need more private care. And, you know, the four of us are committed to publicly funded care. We think it's something special about the way that Canadians think and care about each other. We think it not only represents a cost effective and egalitarian way of providing care based on need rather than ability to pay, but we also think, importantly, that it represents something that's special about the Canadian social tapestry. The fact that we think about people who are the most vulnerable in society and want to see them getting the same access to treatment as the people who are the most privileged. So we've talked about that and thought there's a tremendous push. You know, the chattering class in Toronto and Winnipeg is talking about the need for more private investment, more private profit to come out of care in order to improve it. But certainly we have a lot of stuff we can do. And as we put in those uh, editorials, to make care faster, better, and more cost-effective. And let's look at fixing publicly funded Canadian healthcare with those interventions as a first step, mm -hmm. first step to try and maintain publicly funded care while improving service and access. Now I must say in the times since we wrote those articles, mm -hmm. you can't go a day without looking at a Canadian media report and seeing uh, dramatic stories about healthcare. Probably the most recent, the current cover story in McLean's magazine, Dr. Al Drummond, talking about the meltdown in emergency departments that's occurring across the Canadian system. The exactly. sense of crisis is intensifying, but we still think there's dramatic opportunity to make care better with investment in some cases, but in many cases, implementing stuff that makes care not only faster and better, but also more cost effective. Those are great, great points, Bob. And um, I mean, it is, it is sometimes sad and frustrating when we live in a country like Canada, when we're faced with situations that we feel as, as a top country in the world uh, that we shouldn't be in. Do you think that the government by itself has all those means? It's just a matter of rearranging the pieces, so to speak, rearranging the funding? Or do you think there that, that for example, private or um, industry partnerships are required to fix that crisis as you describe it? Well, I think we need to pay attention to the innovation that comes out of the publicly funded system. And here I'm going to pay a lot of tribute to ophthalmology and vision surgeons. You know, um, first of all, you know, I did a lot of work with uh, Dr. Phil Hooper in Ontario, Dr. Sharif al uh -huh. and other experts. And the one thing I was immediately impressed with, I, I, as an orthopod, I basically do very little about ophthalmology care, but I, I learned a lot. And this was from the perspective of how do we ensure our system is as effective as possible in Ontario. This is about eight or nine years ago. And the one thing I became aware of is you guys have instituted this terrific system of primary care. Uh -huh. where your relationship with optometrists is spectacular. The, you know, the back and forth transition of care of patients who need surgery to ophthalmologists uh, referred by optometrists. The other thing I noticed was that very, very few people who needed urgent crisis care, retinal surgery, for example, uh, failed to get that. That, you know, retinal surgeons organized themselves in regional call schedules, certainly in the province of Ontario. I can't speak to the rest of the country. <laughs> Uh, so that was impressive to me. You know, when people with neurosurgical emergencies in Ontario were being sent to Buffalo for care because our neurosurgery system was so broken. Now, exactly. I'm happy to say that's dramatically changed. It's much better now. You guys never fell into that, that crisis, certainly in this province. You always ensured that people who needed care got access to care. The final thing I'd say, very impressive, is the way that you have moved your treatment to highly effective ambulatory surgery centers. Mm -hmm. you know, starting off with cataract care, moving on to more complex, you know, in my experience in Ontario with the Kensington Eye Center, uh, you know, so impressive in the way that was accomplished. So I've got a lot of respect for what you guys have done, demonstrating that innovation doesn't come from private for-profit sector players. Uh, it can come from publicly funded providers who care deeply about the services they're providing to people who need them. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And, and that actually kind of leads a little bit into some of the three topics that you mentioned in your series, which you've mentioned primary care. So that's one. You've also mentioned community surgery centers or, or, or non-hospital uh, surgical centers. And also you mentioned about e-referrals. So would you mind sort of taking us down those three? You've mentioned a bit of primary care, the collaboration, community centers, but what, what do you mean by e-referrals and how does that impact or how does that help us uh, manage the crisis um, that we're, that we're uh, experiencing at this point? Well, if you don't mind, Guillermo, I'd like to start with a bit more on primary care. Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah. The, the reason I say that is as providers, we have to recognize that when Canadians look at our healthcare system and they consider their confidence in our system, you know, the vast majority of Canadians, they might see an orthopedic surgeon once in their lifetime, an ophthalmologist, one for the left and one for the right, you know, mm -hmm. uh, twice in a lifetime. But their day to day confidence in the system is determined by their relationship and their access to primary care. And when yes. we look at that series, there were two features that we really focused on. One was access, which we're going to talk about today. The other that your, your listeners can, uh, can explore on their own was care for the aged, which became an intense topic of interest during the pandemic, of course, the early stages of the pandemic. But focusing now on access, when we look at our international ranking as a health system, you know, the Commonwealth Fund report is probably amongst the best ways to kind of determine rankings of international uh, healthcare systems. You know, we're second from the bottom and have been forever, mm -hmm. just above the United States. And the reason is because of access, access and surprisingly equity. And access starts with primary care. No question that, you know, all the encounters that people have is their first encounter regarding either health improvement or managing a health problem starts with their primary care provider. And if they can't access that individual, they can't get referred to anyone else. They can't get x-rays. They obviously, that is a sine qua non of being able to feel confidence in your, your healthcare system. And, and, you know, that access, that confidence is failing. Uh, as recently as the early part of September, Angus Reid published a survey of over 2,000 Canadians showing that only 13% of the people they surveyed felt comfortable that they could get access to their primary care physician. Mm -hmm. You know, 15% of them didn't have a primary care doc and were looking for one. But of the ones that did have, only 13% felt comfortable that they could get access when needed. And, you know, even comparison to our United States neighbors who don't have great access for many people in their system, over 50% of Americans asked the same question, said, yeah, I can get access to healthcare when I need it. Mm -hmm. And Canada was 13%. So we clearly have a problem that's been brewing for some time and has become more problematic because of the pandemic. And why, why is it? it? You know, it's because, first of all, we've been sold, I think, a bit of a bill of goods by medical associations across the country that every Canadian needs a family doctor. And I think that commentary needs to be changed to every Canadian needs a primary care provider. Uh, there's lots of literature out there that shows that nurse practitioners can provide care that's, you know, office-based care, not hospital-based care, mm -hmm. not emergency department-based care, but office-based care that, you know, doesn't differ much from primary care physicians. Now, mm -hmm. those physicians can do a lot of other stuff, right? I'm not suggesting they're cool and they're not. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can take a call as a hospitalist. They can go into the emergency department. But when it comes to the chronic relationship-based care in primary care offices, nurse practitioners are certainly taking an increasing role around the world. Mm -hmm. We only have 6,000 primary care nurse practitioners, 6,000 nurse practitioners in total in Canada, mm -hmm. we desperately, desperately need more. And these people need to be practicing in team-based models so that they're practicing with primary care physicians mm -hmm. so that if a problem occurs that is beyond the nurse practitioner's capability, the opportunity for referral is, is there. But in primary care nurse practitioner practices across the country, there are 26 nurse practitioner-led clinics in Ontario, set, patient satisfaction is excellent mm -hmm. and comprehensive care is provided. The other thing that we need to do is we need to relook at the way that family physicians are actually funded. The small business model that served us well for decades 
is no longer what people want coming out of medical school, coming out of residency. They don't want to organize an office. Most people don't want to hire people. Most people don't want to make the decision mm -hmm. about what health EMR they're going to invest in. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing across the country now, about 50% of family docs in Ontario, which by the way, has the highest proportion of attached patients, the fewest unattached patients in the country, Ontario's the leader, about 50% of our docs practice in a capitated model where they don't do fee for service, tra transactional care, they're, they're capitated, they get a capitated payment for accepting people into the roster. Mm -hmm. That has just been moved into place in British Columbia in responding to their crisis in access to primary care, along with a commitment to more nurse practitioners. So I think if we look at the future of primary care, in Canada, we're gonna see a sea change away from the small business model toward a model where physicians are paid in a different way to do what they wanna do, which is practice medicine, not manage a practice. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna see much more team-based care with other mm -hmm. providers, with you know, mental health workers, with physiotherapists, with mm -hmm. physicians assistants, but especially nurse practitioners expanding the roster. Mm -hmm. Uh, who can do primary care. So that's my first pick. Let me, you know, I'm just going to ask you because there's so much, so much in what you just said, uh, Bob, and so interesting. I mean, one of the things I think we are seeing is I think also us or as physicians, we need to kind of be educated on how the roles of these nurse practitioners are, are essential, right? Because sometimes we may have our own biases or barriers to towards accepting referrals or questioning uh, if the referral is appropriate. And the second question is, once you start forming these, these groups of practitioners, as you mentioned, primary care physicians with capitated models, nurse practitioners, physiotherapists, who organizes that? Do you still attribute that to the government or do you think there's some kind of entrepreneurship there? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, Guillermo. And uh, I think there are lots of different models that are forming across the country. If you look at the role of, uh, for example, Shoppers Drug Mart mm -hmm. across the country is uh, organizing primary care practices adjacent to some pharmacist mm -hmm. or pharmacies. And why is that? Well, the answer is obvious. The th two things that determine the foot traffic in a pharmacy is number one is their parking, parking being an essential aspect of providing healthcare, as you know. Mm -hmm. And the second is, is there a primary care physician writing physician or writing prescriptions that get transmitted that, you know, not only increase pharmacy sales, but increase front of the store sales as well. So clearly if, you can get a primary care practice going adjacent to a pharmacy, you can increase sales volumes at a pharmacy. So there yeah. are retail interests that are interested in doing that. And from my perspective, if you can make more profit in a pharmacy, profit making pharmacy is part of our healthcare system. I have no problem at all if they're also offering excellent primary care. Because of mm -hmm. course, once shoppers gets into that business, once any company gets into that business, they want to ensure accountability for the primary care services provided, especially exactly. when it comes to access. So that's one model. There are other mm -hmm. models where, um, you know, you can have community-based boards that run primary care practices. In Ontario, the best example for that is community health centers, where you have physicians, nurses, a variety of different providers uh, who are focused on the needs of, uh, of vulnerable people, people experiencing homelessness, refugees, et cetera. Um, you can also have primary care practices associated with hospitals. Um, you're absolutely right that expanding these team-based models, you know, within the current small business framework of primary care, the way it's existed for decades is hard. And we need to think about that governance and management model in a different mm -hmm. way. We have family health teams in Ontario, about 15% of care is provided through family health teams that are team-based. And they have an executive director that's responsible for organizing the office, the rentals, the hiring, et cetera. Okay. Um, and they're usually you know, groups of 10 or more physicians with nurse practitioners, et cetera. The thing I don't like about that model is the nurse practitioners are not practicing the full scope. They are assisting primary care doctors mm. who are responsible for rostering the patients. To me, the best model is one in which you've got a team where everybody has responsibility for their own roster of patients. Okay. You're absolutely right. Management and governance of those models is an essential part of what we need to think about.
Icon wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. I'm Phil Hooper. I'm the president of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and I listen to and enjoy the ICANN podcast. Good. So would you like to talk then about the e-referrals next? Yeah. Is that, uh, I, okay. I'm, I'm a little crazy when it comes to e-referrals. I'm so passionate about this. For me, when I was deaf <laughs> in Ontario, we made some investments uh, to try and get e-referral kicked up. And of course, the pandemic has slowed down the implementation of so many different things that are needed. But to me, e-referral, uh, first of all, you know, faster and better. Uh, well, if you have a referral being sent to the surgeon, the specialist with the shortest wait list, you know, uh, that kind of queue management immediately drops wait times by about 20% simply by managing the, the, the surgical or the, the weight to which this, the, the specialist's weight is being uh, considered as patients are distributed through an electronic referral system. So that's one thing. You get faster care. Without any mm -hmm. investment in money, you get faster care. Mm -hmm. Better, you first of all, uh, the patient gets information about when the referral is going. You know how many times a patient's phoned your office, Guillermo, and said, Right. If facts from the family doctor arrive. I need to be seen in your office. Can you make sure the facts hasn't been lost? You know what I mean? That's right. I mean, it's just a common daily occurrence. I'm sure all of our uh, assistants experience. And in e-referral, there's an email sent to the patient. You know, um, Dr. Smith has uh, referred the patient to Dr. Rocha. His office has received it. Dr. Rocha says your wait time is probably going to be about two and a half months or whatever it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so the patient's informed. So that's better care to begin with. And talk about smarter care. Well, you know, we talk about wait times. Well, the only wait mm -hmm. time information we have in Canada relates to patients who have surgery. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're, if the patient's referred to you in Manitoba and doesn't need surgery, they don't appear on the wait times data that's presented. Mm -hmm. So the amount of time that a non-surgical patient spends waiting to see you, nobody has any idea about and of course, if it's a patient being referred to a hematologist or a pulmonary specialist, zero information. Exactly. So I used to sit with the deans of Ontario medical schools to talk to them about the distribution of residency positions. You know, do we need more gynecologists, more hematologists, more pulmonary? But where, where, where should we be investing? And those investment decisions were made with an absolute lack of real data. Mm. It was anecdotal information. Well, you know, I think it's taken longer to see a benign hematologist than maybe, you know what I mean? No data about how yeah. long it took to see a hematologist. So that an investment in the future that is uh, dependent on real data about where we have backlogs in wait times to see specialists and therefore should be investing in the health human resources of the future. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, the, the, the other thing that's significant is using a referral. We can also use e-consult and probably not, well, maybe some ophthalmologists receive e-consults, e probably not because you need to see the patient to provide an opinion in most cases, mm -hmm. but many specialists, diabetes docs, cardiologists, perhaps, you know, primary care docs can send them patient's history. Here's some investigations. And here's my question for you. And in Ontario, certainly the e-consult will respond within 48 hours in most cases. I think the average time of response is 48 hours. Primary mm -hmm. care docs using this love it. The patient doesn't have to travel. It may be the patient has to go and see the doc. That happens probably only about 10 to 15% of the time. Usually the primary care doc gets the information from the evaluation of the question, the interpretation of the lab materials. So e-referral and e-consult to me make the system faster, better, cheaper, and smarter. And why is it cheaper? Because wait times are expensive, you know, uh, mm -hmm. well, you know, they cost the economy money and, uh, you know, repeated visits. If you're not going to get, if you're not seeing the specialist and you're worried about it, guess where you go, you go to the emergency department, you know, That's so right. anything we can do to make specialty referrals 
faster and better <laughs> for no investment, minimal investment makes sense. And the only thing that stops this from happening is simply resistance to change. Now, practically speaking, Bob, uh, with e-referrals and e-consults, are these part of the usual EMR programs that we already have, or is it a, a per-province per uh, package or per-province software that one signs up to? Uh, because, I mean, it makes a lot of sense presented like that, as opposed to simply sending the facts. And I, I really like the idea of gathering that data and having those metrics. But how does one go from a practical point of view implementing that in, in, in their offices? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's a little different province by province. Uh, my understanding is the Connected Care uh, program in Alberta is including any consult e referral mechanism. In Ontario, there's a company, Cognizant MD, that's been brought up by a PC company called Well Health, I believe. But mm -hmm. the e consult, e refer e referral is integrated with most of the big three, you know, the big three across the country, electronic medical records interface readily with e-referral. E-consult, mm -hmm. people tell me, is not as well integrated, needs to be better integrated. So certainly the two things that government can do are to tell both the EMR vendors and mm -hmm. the e referral e-consult stuff, come on, guys, you got to make this smooth. You can't have separate sign-ons. That's what primary care docs all of us hate is if you got to sign out of one system into another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. should be able to single sign on from your emr it should be a downloaded demographics and problem list into the material you're sending to the specialist um you know e-referral is pretty good right now i understand from primary care docs that are using it and the inertia <laughs> is the big issue you know um it's getting better but right now only about 30%, less than 30% of consults in the country, according to Canada Health InfoA, are using e-referral. Mm -hmm. And that number hasn't really budged over the last, you know, through the pandemic, it hasn't budged. It probably hasn't budged in the last five years. This is something that government simply needs to do. They need to say, we need better integrated software. And by <laughs> the way, ophthalmologists of Canada, if you're not on e-referral so that people can refer to you in this way at some point in the future, you know, God knows what, right? We're going to discount your concept. You know, it, 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 there just <laughs> simply needs to be a statement that says this needs to be the practice of the future. It's one thing the federal government could do in making renewed investments in the Canadian healthcare system to, to say this is something that needs to be in place for every Canadian over the next three to five years or something. You know, we need to have just a statement from governance. Governments, yeah. this is going to happen and there's going to be some date. And, you know, physicians faced with that you don't need to have mm -hmm. you don't need to have a big stick at the end of that. Physicians will move, but right now government isn't trying to influence it particularly that I can see. Okay. Now we see this wave of uh, surgical centers coming across Canada, and uh, you know there's many similarities between orthopedic surgery and our specialty in ophthalmology. We even have set up a, a task force basically to look and assess and give some guiding principles to the non-hospital surgical facilities. Uh, we deal with complex cases in on the one hand, and then with less complex, less risk or lower risk cases on the other hand. What are what are your views on this? And um, I know you've mentioned it as part of the aspects that, that are important to discuss, but what are your opinions? Where is this going? How do we make it uh, feasible? And how do we make it um, maintaining the concepts of the Canada Health Act within range? Yeah, thanks, Guillermo. Those are great questions. Um, well, first of all, I think we <laughs> lag. The one place where we lag dramatically behind our American neighbors is in the movement of uh, surgical procedures into ambulatory, purpose-built, designed ambulatory surgery centers, procedural centers. And you know, you start off, why should we do this? Well, you start off, as ophthalmologists know and orthopedic surgeons know, that if you have a well-organized, purpose-built ambulatory surgery facility, you can do at least 20% more work in the same time. You know, you're, you're, you're focused on high volume, procedures they're not necessarily minor procedures you can do total knees certainly you can do spine surgery you can do retinal surgery but everything's based on today we're going to do cataracts and we're going to do 22 cataracts and our turnover time is going to be quick we're going to have anesthesia assistants looking after people 
They're going to be blocked. You know what I mean? And, you know, they're going to be in the same chair that gets moved through the circuit. Um, and you simply, you know, can do stuff that hospitals are not designed to do. Hospitals have a broad expanse of responsibilities. Ambulatory surgery centers simply need to do high volume throughput ambulatory surgery. And, you know, when I was deputy in, in Ontario, we looked at surgery being done across the province and estimated that at least half, probably more, of the surgery being done in hospitals could be moved into dedicated community surgery centers. And, um, you know, do we need to invoke private sector in that? Well, I know that that's sometimes the case for ophthalmology, where you've got vision correcting centers that are set up as in Ontario, we call them independent health facilities, where that you can do cataracts and that where people are getting their cataracts done today. My view is that ambulatory surgery centers to be most effective should be governed by hospitals. <laughs> Why is that? I mean, and I'm going to leave ophthalmology aside and then come back to ophthalmology for a moment. But let's look at let's look at total joints. OK, let's look okay. at total knees, total hips. Right now, most of those in Canada are done in hospitals. If I'm the deputy minister of health and I say to hospitals, look, I'm going to pay you the same amount for a total knee or total hip, whether you do it in your big hospital or whether you do it in an ambulatory surgery center. Wow. Am I going to move to put that into an ambulatory surgery center? Absolutely. I'm going to be able to do more total knees in the same day in an ambulatory surgery center. And if you pay me the same amount that you pay me when they're in the hospital without the patient needing an overnight bed, I'm getting money to be able to do other things, invest in other things. That's what's happened in Ontario. There's been a tremendous move in total joints to day surgery. And day surgery is always more effective in community surgery centers. So I think we have a huge potential to move stuff there. The thing that worries me about the Alberta approach, and I'm not exactly sure where it stands, of uh, setting up for-profit surgery centers uh -huh. is that you know systems are designed to achieve what they're set up to do. If you're opening a for-profit surgery center, your goal is to create a profit, as much profit as possible. So are you going to, you know, maybe a bit of a crude, crude term, but are you going to cream the milk to ensure that the patients that are going to be the most cost-effective, the highest profit that you know that scope of the knee is going to be done in 40 minutes and we can get on to the next case and we do 12 scopes a day, the thing that worries me most about for-profit ambulatory surgery is the appropriateness of care in the case selection. Mm. You know, if you're talking to a hospital quality committee about the surgery that's being done, you've got, you know, appropriateness criteria. A good example in orthopedics is our proscopy of the knee for degenerative joint disease. There is tons of literature, randomized studies that demonstrate it doesn't really help doesn't make people that much better. It doesn't delay the need for a total knee. But you can say to someone in your office, look, we're going to try and move you along for another couple of years, avoid a total knee. We're going to do a little scope and we're going to clean up your knee. Mm. Right. Let me tell you, if we've got for-profit surgery centers, they're going to do a lot of degenerative disease knee <laughs> arthroscopy, you know, because it's quick. Yeah. It's um, now, ophthalmology is an interesting issue because – you guys have these, uh, you know, these opportunities to upsell people, right? I mean, the, the classic, I was talking to someone tonight before we started this, who, uh, you know, was telling me about his great experience in a, uh, he got his cataract done in a private center, a vision correction center in Toronto, where of course the surgeon gets paid for doing the cataract. They bill our provincial health system. Mm -hmm. the facility gets nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Ontario hospitals typically get about 450 to 500 bucks for doing a cataract, um, the surgery center gets zero. So why are they doing it? And of course, the reason is they upsell a bunch of stuff, right? They yeah. upsell advice regarding nutrition and, you know, uh, what you should be doing in the way of vitamins. And of course, they upsell lenses. Now, you know, publicly funded facilities also upsell lenses. Some lenses are better than others, I understand. I don't understand it well, but, mm -hmm. but I can guarantee you the cost of those lenses in for-profit centers are going to be higher than they would be in publicly funded centers. Mm -hmm. And if we think about the principle of Canadian public funded health care, that care should be somewhat equal and treat people who have different income levels in virtually the same way, 
it just always wrinkles me when, you know, people are being asked to pay out of pocket for something they could get at a different price in a publicly funded system. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the biggest reason I say this is uh, the concept that, oh, we need for-profit centers because they'll be innovative. Well, you know, the Kensington Eye Center in Toronto is innovative in the way it does anesthesia. It's innovative in a variety of things, the way it teaches, the way it does research, the way it, you know, I, I, I don't know the area well enough, but I do know it's an innovative place. Hmm. And it's publicly funded, you know, hmm. it uh, is not for profit. It runs according to a publicly governed board. And, uh, you know, you don't need for, you need what for profit innovates is how to make more profit. That's my bottom line. Okay. And uh, sticking with the uh, outside of hospital surgical facilities, and, and I know we have several educational programs across the country where a lot of the residents are trained in many of these centers. Do you see any impact across other specialties when we're doing more and more procedures in ambulatory centers? Or how do you kind of, um, how do you uh, m marry or reconcile, I guess, the educational yeah. portion with the more efficient throughput of, of patients that require uh, medically needed procedures? Yeah, you know, I don't think that education needs to be slower. I think, you know, obviously there is something around the speed at which a learner does stuff. Um, but I think, you know, we can accept a slightly longer operating time. The biggest I think we all know the biggest, uh, you know, uh, factor that determines length of time is is the throughput time, right? It's the turnover, it's the anesthesia time, it's the transit time, the transport time. Uh, <laughs> surgery is probably thirty or forty percent of the variability factor in that. So mm -hmm. I think design a. I know the Kensington is a uh, is a teaching center. Uh, Ottawa has the Riverside Hospital. Um, Hamilton has uh, Stony Creek and. My good friend, Phil Hooper, you know, in the Ivy Center, uh, another ambulatory surgery center in London, mm -hmm. Ontario, which is a teaching center. You know, uh, the good thing is, I think the teaching becomes systematized. Mm -hmm. In order to achieve high throughput, you think through the kind of industrial engineering aspect of how you're going to do every case. So this case, we need to teach the... The, the learner how to faco or we need to, mm -hmm. I don't know what, you know, exactly. how, to it, how to put in the stent, I don't know, and mm -hmm. uh, for glaucoma, whatever it is. And, um, you know, it may lengthen the operation by seven minutes. That's okay. Mm -hmm. expected. So exactly. I think teaching can absolutely build into the ambulatory surgery environment. It may make things a bit longer, but the overall improvement and throughput is so dramatic. Excellent. Well, we've covered so many, so many topics, and I'd like to direct our listeners to your uh, website, uh, drbobbell.com, which has a lot, a lot of information. But one thing that caught my attention, Bob, is um, your comparison and your discussion on the different uh, systems across the world in industrialized nations. And I have a question. I don't want to put you on the spot. Because I know there's no perfect system, probably, but uh, which system should we be striving for? Like, which which could be a model system for Canada as we move forward? Yeah, well, I, you know, I mean, uh, people make disparaging comments about the Canadian system being similar to North Korea and Cuba and being the only system in the world that doesn't have a parallel private system. Well, we do have a big private system. You know, if we look at our pharmacy systems, they are private for profit. If we look at the way that most primary care is organized in the country, it's, you know, a small business for profit model. Um, <laughs> physiotherapy in most places is <laughs> paid for either by private health insurance or by, or by uh, out of pocket payment, dental care in this country. So if we compare ourselves to most of Western Europe, we have more for profit care <laughs> than those places have, you know, <laughs> It's just we've constrained ourselves to hospital and doctor-based care under the Canada Health Act mm. being only publicly funded. Now, we know there are lots of wrinkles in that in Quebec and in a variety of places, the Brian Day experience, the Canby Clinic. We know that there's stuff happening on, on the margins. My view is we should struggle to increase the equity of our system. We should include pharmacare. We should include at least some aspect of dental care in our publicly funded system. Pharmacare, we'd actually save money 
going to a publicly funded system. The pharma companies hate it when I say this, but it's true. <laughs> if we actually, where they make their profit is not in the provincial drug plans, it's in the private drug plans that don't manage costs as well as okay. the publicly funded plans do. So to me, our system is unique, I agree, but it really, to me, Guillermo, it defines what's best about Canadians, you know? Mm -hmm. We don't want to see people making profit out of institutionalized care for, uh, for sick, vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. We want people to access care based on need rather than the ability to pay. And I think we should struggle to maintain that system and to avoid the various erosions that I know there's going to be erosions of I it, mean, no question. I mean, the example of paying more for a lens to get better access to care in a private Hertz mm -hmm. center and, you know, or whatever the centers are called in Toronto. I get it. There's going to be that happening on the margin. It's not like people should be thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. I think we should struggle to maintain public funding as the predominant way we provide care and to say, no, we don't need a parallel. The one I've seen in Australia and New Zealand, which are frequently pointed out to us, I've seen as orthopedic surgeon going there, you know, 50% of people in Australia have private health insurance and they get treated for some things in private hospitals, total joints being a great example. Mm -hmm. You know, the difference between the public and private wait times in Australia are like a year long difference, right? They're very, very long differences. And, you know, Australians are paying a lot for their private health insurance. So I think we've got a system that we should not readily give up. I think we should say this system is under strain. It's under struggle. Health human resource shortages are making it very crisis driven right now. But let's work hard. Let's work hard at trying to maintain the aspirational and inspirational approach that we've developed to healthcare in this country. Thank you so much. This has been an uh, extremely enlightening uh, conversation, really, Bob. Uh, your view of approaching the different problems and, and giving us a bit of an optimistic view right now as well is uh, very encouraging for us uh, moving forward as well. Um, as we come to the uh, end of the interview, we always like to ask our guests about some of their non-professional activities. Uh, I was so excited to see that you've actually done something that many people talk about in their lives, which is writing a book and not only a book, but three novels. Can you tell us a little bit about that or maybe other activities that you like doing outside of your work? So, so Guillermo, I am a shameless huckster. I am expert at product placement. So thanks for the opportunity. Do go <laughs> on my website, Ophthalmology for Canada, Dr. D -R -B -O -B -B -E -L -L com. And you will go to the landing page where you can order the most recent novel called Jonah K. <laughs> you can order the second novel, New Dark and Maple Ridge, or the first novel, which for an orthopod had an unimaginative name, it was called Hip. Uh, <laughs> three novels, the, uh, we've uh, taken the profits from each of these, all the royalties derived from these, and have donated them to various uh, activities in the UHN University Health Network Foundation. So far, we've donated $31,000 over the space of three books. Um, and I'm most proud of Jonah Kay, the one that's out right now. It deals with the topic of intergenerational trauma resulting from residential schools and indigenous communities in Canada. Something that like many Canadians is uh, something we're all on a learning curve about. Uh, when I became deputy minister, I didn't know much about intergenerational trauma. I learned a lot from indigenous people who were generous in teaching me and this book is a again an optimistic approach to thinking about how we need to reconcile as a nation how we need to recognize the impact of colonialism on indigenous peoples in this country uh and i think some fun characters and a good story so i'd encourage your uh, <laughs> listeners to go on drbobbell.com and order as many copies for your holiday <laughs> as you can awesome <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bob Bell, for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more episodes of the ICANN podcast. ICANN wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. 
Season three of the ICAN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. Thank you to the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. The ICAN podcast is written and directed by Kim Teitler and produced by John Allaire from Allaire Strategic Works. Thank you.